I was listening to the discussion before lunch of the smart grid and the difficulty of different power sources and, and, and how the smart grid has to deal with uh, increasingly uh, complex and shifting uh, renewable sources of power and, and so forth. And, I, and I, 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 I had to think of Ambassador Fujisaki, who is kind of a smart grid himself, because he had to deal with a changing power source in Washington when he first arrived, and now he has to deal with a new power source in Tokyo, and uh, the, the, uh, the, the surge of uh, power is unpredictable, and uh, he's in the middle like the smart grid, uh, d d dealing with all of, the, uh, all of this, hopefully not blowing up. <coughs> um, Ambassador Fujisaki is um, a friend of many years. He's had a very distinguished career in the foreign ministry. He served in uh, Washington before as political uh, minister uh, in the mid-1990s um, in London, in uh, Jakarta, in Paris, um, has served as a uh, Director General of North American Affairs, where I had the uh, opportunity to work with him when I was in the NSC, uh, in the Bush administration at that time, um, and as Ambassador to the International Organizations in Geneva, um, and in his current post as uh, Japan's Ambassador to the United States. Um, uh, we've had a very interesting discussion, Ambassador, about um, the different uh, pathways uh, to a low-carbon society and, and the ample opportunities for technical, technological um, engineering and business cooperation, some of the political challenges that both U.S. and Japanese governments face uh, moving forward on climate change. Um, and we're hoping now that you'll tie it all together for us and then and, 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 uh, and help us end the conference with a with some, some good thoughts on how we can enhance our collaboration. My sense is there are many, many areas, uh, many of which the two governments have already started on, and we look forward to hearing your, your views on those. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. It was not an easy day, for not only for me, but all of you. So uh, very much impressed that uh, so many people there I thought maybe 10 or 12 people <laughs> sitting around the table. Uh, I had to come because uh, I owe a lot to CSIS. Uh, uh, one day John Hamry said, uh, you're spending so much time here in CSIS, uh, you may be uncomfortable in your office. <laughs> I, the reality, he didn't say that. He said, shall I offer you a desk in my CSIS? And uh, my wife was listening next to me, and she said, yes, please. <laughs> but, uh, and also, the reason I came was that uh, one day I was at CSIS, and uh, Michael Green was there at the entrance. He said, uh, hey, remember, Ambassador Fujisaki, you have a speaking engagement with us. Uh, sorry, it's not going to be your favorite subject of Tenma, but uh, you have to talk on something you don't know at all, uh, energy, environment. So I said, I have to challenge it. So I'm here. Now, uh, uh, first, uh, I have to say that uh, Mr. Fukuyama, an architect of Japanese uh, environment uh, policy, regrets that he can't be here himself here. Uh, because of diet engagement. And uh, he sends uh, his best regard to his uh, old friend uh, John Hamry and uh, Michael Green. Uh, if I may say, uh, talk about a bit of Japanese policy, I think I'll focus on that. Lightning has struck Japan on September the 9th, 7th. That was when Prime Minister-to-be, Mr. Hatoyama, said that our midterm goal for 2020 would be a 25% cut from 1990 level. It should not have been a news. However, it was. It should not have been news because it was already clearly stated in Index 2009, which is a campaign document of Democratic Party of Japan, DPJ. So everyone knew it. But still people thought, is this serious? Because of two reasons. One, because three months before that, in June 2009, 
then Prime Minister, Mr. Asso, stated that our midterm goal will be a 15% cut from 2005 level. And people thought that was such an ambitious goal. But in 1990 level, as you know, that's an 8% cut. By the way, U.S. Uh, uh, Congress 17% uh, 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 cut proposal uh, from 2005 level is, as I understand, 4% cut from 1990 level. So what Japan was proposing was already ambitious, and this was already several times ambitious. That's the first reason. Second was that Japan had been a number one energy efficient country for a long time, more than two decades. In order to produce a dollar of GDP, if Japan needed one unit of energy, US EU needed twice, Russia 17 times, China eight, uh, nine times, India seven times. So it was almost like asking Kate Moss to go on a diet. <laughs> I hope you know who is Kate Moss. <laughs> How, and some Japanese top businessmen grumbled that if we had to do this and if others are not doing that, then a lot of Japanese business have to leave the country to invest abroad. However, Japanese leaders maintained the position. And on uh, late September, in New York, uh, on the occasion of uh, major economies uh, forum, Prime Minister Hatoyama made his statement and said, midterm goal of Japan would be 25% cut from 1990 level. But also, he also said, Japan can not only do, be ambitious. All major countries have to do that as well. We have to construct fair and effective international forum. And Japan's commitment is on the premise that all the major countries would do its share. And this was a very bold initiative, and I think it surprised some leaders. Of, however, it was well received too. Why then the Japanese leader took this position? Two reasons. One, sense of urgency. I think, uh, in short, the thinking was, it's not too late, but no time to waste. So Japan wanted to take a lead in the road to Copenhagen and in the Copenhagen as well. That was exactly what we did. Second reason, Japan thought that uh, that would try to help the economy. New introduction of new technology and also creating green jobs. So, Japan maintained the position and this was uh, with the experience that we had. In 1970s, we had two oil shocks and it was a very difficult uh, experience. However, we all with, in hindsight know that it created the Japan today. So that conviction, I think, was the background of this uh, maintaining the position. Now, uh, Copenhagen, we can't call it a great success, of course. However, it was a certain success in view of the circumstance given. It really made a, 
uh, result. The result was that it prepared a ground for the framework, international framework. Now let's talk about future. Mexico COP16 is a wave. We have to prepare that. And this is one of the priority agenda, top priority agenda for Japan. For in Copenhagen, we aim at creating fair and effective international framework. And in that framework, I think we can say that there may be four components. A, B, C, D towards Mexico, maybe you can, you can call it. A is ambition have to be maintained. Japan has already A for ambition. A, ambition, Japan's goal, as I said, was the midterm level was 25% cut from, 2000, uh, from 1990. And we have already registered that to the Secretariat of Copenhagen. Now what's important for us is to put into concrete policies. Jap Japanese leaders have said that we'll try to engage all policy tools for that. And uh, this is prescribed in new growth strategy, which was uh, issued December last year, only two months ago. It includes electric power, feed-in tariffs, uh, smart grids, next generation automobiles, other all tools that we can think of, and something has to be added on as well. With that, we expect we'll have a new market, energy-related market of $500 trillion, which is equivalent to more than $50 billion domestic market. And it would create 4 million new jobs. With that uh, strategy, we also expect that uh, greenhouse gases would be reduced by 1.3 billion tons CO2 equivalent. That's the A. Now B is a broad participation. Kyoto was a historic milestone. It was a success, certain success. However, we all know that only 30% of world emitters are now member of Kyoto, bound by Kyoto. China, India, Brazil, South Africa, all those uh, basics are not bound. And United States is not a member as well. Although it was important, if we do, didn't have all that member, we can't say that's effective too. We cannot repeat that. And for that, we are very much encouraged by State of Union in which President Obama said that he will try to uh, put forth a climate bill and also he pressed on with a climate bill and also he stated positively towards uh, nuclear power as well. C is uh, comparability or transparency. Ambition is important. However, we have to know that that's a verifiable figure. We have to know scientifically as well. And through those uh, uh, targets that we can put trust on, there'll be a confidence building. This is such an important target for all the countries. We have to have confidence towards each other. 
which we may have, which do, we don't have now. And we hope that tool to replace post Kyoto, to Kyoto will be such as well. Lastly, D, that's, as you all can imagine, is a development assistance. In 2005, 50% of uh, emissions are done by developing countries. We have to have them. But at the same time, we have to remember three things. One, it is true that the present situation of global warming was mainly brought about by developed countries. So developed countries must have special responsibilities. Two, it's also true that more, uh, most of the developed countries have more technology and funds than developing countries. Three, some of the minor, smaller countries are more vulnerable to climate change than others, and they need some special attention. They are weaker, uh, and for and see uh, some of the uh, deserts uh, widening in the country. Uh, some of the uh, uh, flood uh, are hitting uh, many of the floods hitting, and uh, they deserve assistance from developed countries. So uh, Japan is committed to help developing countries in this uh, path towards uh, post-Kyoto. We, in Copenhagen, Mr. Hatoyama announced new initiative. We call it Hatoyama Initiative of assisting developing countries, which would amount to $15 billion. And 12 out of 15 is public finance. This uh, 15 billion is uh, from 2010 to 2012, three years. Altogether, developed countries have committed $30 billion public finance towards developed countries from 2010 to 12, the same year. So you can see how big the share of Japan is in the development assistance. And that is because of the reasons that I have given you. Lastly, United States and Japan. We have cooperated very well in Copenhagen. One figure always lingering on my mind is that according to IEA, International Energy Agency affiliated to OECD, 72% of world public investment in research and development in the energy sector is done by t only two countries, 31% by United States, 41% by Japan. This shows that two countries have special responsibilities. When President Obama visited uh, Tokyo in November last year, we issued a joint fact sheet and in which we express the areas of cooperation. This fact sheet was mainly on clean energy program, technology program, and we expressed our intention on smart grid, carbon capture sequestration, CCS, 
and we will continue on with that. But also, we hope that we can cooperate on high-speed railway as well, because this, only two weeks ago, Secretary Lahoud announced several areas where he would put uh, federal money into helping uh, the uh, high-speed railway in this country, which uh, is, uh, I didn't say, maybe we are a bit ahead of the United States on, in that account, and uh, we would like to be of a help as well. And uh, now, Mexico, COP16, is ahead of us. We have to jointly outreach to the basic countries, the Brazil, South Africa, India, China, and those countries as well. We have uh, had 10 days ago President Calderon of Mexico's visit to Japan, and we said we will cooperate wholeheartedly to the success of Mexico meeting. And we can also coordinate our policies on financing of uh, developing countries as well in this area. I've been talking to some experts, and maybe we share a hunch in the United States as well as in Japan, a hunch that we are now entering a total new area, new era. Like automobile has changed the world, like computer has changed the world, this energy efficiency may really change our life and industry totally. United States is very good at make, making challenges. We all know that uh, in the, uh, uh, you're uh, uh, going to cr across the country and uh, explore the West, uh, you have learned that those who go first will get more a golden share, and maybe that applies here as well. So we will try to do as much as possible, and we think United States will do that, and we jointly can work together in that field. In short, we should not miss the bus. The bus name is Post Kyoto, and the next stop or maybe the last stop will be Mexico. I thank you very much. Uh, he wants me to take questions on Ftema. <laughs> <laughs> As, as long as it's not on uh, uh, domestic politics or whatever, I'm ready to answer any questions. Yes, thank you. And uh, also, uh, my colleagues, uh, I think uh, there are some from embassy who are eager to uh, take floor, uh, would like to answer uh, questions. In turn. Oh, that's Mr. Nishinaga. I happen to fi find him. So. <laughs> thank you, Ambassador. Ian Talley, Dow Jones Newswires. Why don't you come up, Nishinawa-san? Maybe you can really, uh, if it's a technical issue. Yes, sir. Thank you, I'm Ambassador. Sorry. No, no, not at all. Uh, you said we should not miss the bus. Uh, you talked about um, uh, the necessity to move ahead, uh, the timing the successes and, say, shortcomings of Copenhagen. Uh, is there a role or should there be a, a higher emphasis on the roles of other forums for negotiating an international agreement, particularly since uh, you mentioned the responsibility of the larger emitters? 
um, such as the one that Todd Stern proposed before he became climate envoy, uh, such as the E8. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, yes, uh, I have emphasized that uh, we have to really have a sense of urgency, and uh, I think Copenhagen uh, was a certain success, because as I said, it uh, 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 prepare the ground for negotiation, for the agreement. Some skeptics would say, if the leaders were not able to come to agreement, how can officials do that later? We don't take that view. We think they really prepare the ground, and uh, now uh, we don't have to take a pessimistic view that could be interpreted into self-fulfilling prophecy. Now, what's important now is uh, try to discuss, but not that we have to, maybe in some cases we uh, meet in uh, three or four or uh, whatever in uh, uh, some smaller configuration, but what is needed is not to create a fora, but uh, uh, we try to maintain what we have and try to spend not too much on uh, the uh, fora issue, but really continue to negotiate and discuss. Uh, uh, I don't know if I'm answering uh, uh, clearly, but uh, spend time on substance rather than uh, formalities, uh, I think, our position. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, my name is Dan Goldstein. I'm with Clean Skies TV News. My question is, uh, does the Japanese government still have confidence in the IPCC's uh, uh, climate reports and their assessment? And does the IPCC need to uh, have new leadership at the top uh, before, uh, before the next uh, meeting in uh, Mexico? I'm sorry, I have uh, no, uh, uh, not uh, uh, really gone into this issue, but uh, there, I know that there are reports uh, about uh, uh, some uh, 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 problems with some parts of the report. Uh, however, all in all, I think uh, what uh, the message coming from uh, uh, the uh, report or the committee was important, and I don't think uh, we uh, lose all the confidence in it. In it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hossein Ebn Yusuf, International Petroleum Enterprises. Uh, you mentioned the oil crises of uh, 1970s, and uh, I remember reading that uh, Japan's trade with the Arab states after the, uh, the Arab oil embargo went up by tenfold. Uh, that's an order of magnitude. I was wondering if uh, the new uh, ideas that you mentioned and, and the view of, of the Japan, if you have an estimate of the, the positive impact on Japan's trade with the outside world uh, because of this new policy or proposed uh, policy that you talked about. Oh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, yes, uh, uh, I think, uh, as I said, uh, those who would try to uh, put more effort into this uh, very promising area may have some advantage in the first place uh, on uh, exporting those technologies but uh, or material, uh, goods as well, but uh, all in all, this is for uh, coping with the climate change, which everyone has to cope with, so these technology has to be shared as well, and uh, I, I don't think it's uh, thinking that we monopolize something. We, it has to be shared, and that's exactly the reason what we would like to uh, share the technology with developing countries as well, and uh, try to use that fund that I was saying to try to pass these technologies, transmit them to uh, uh, developing countries. So in meanwhile, of course, uh, uh, like any other uh, inventions, innovations, those who go ahead uh, may get uh, some uh, uh, 
advantage, and I think we would look at that. We would be hoping to do that as well, as I said, creating jobs and things like that. However, in the long run, that has to be, everyone has to uh, be uh, at, at, uh, taking advantage from uh, this uh, innovation. Thank you very much. Mr. Ambassador, this is Mac Corino from uh, Virginia Tech. I have a question. As an out of uh, industrial economics, uh, uh, in the 80s, uh, United States suffered from the competitiveness in the economic and the industrial area. And the, the Japanese government, even the high speed train and also uh, productivity and then, uh, uh, compete, uh, the uh, uh, quality control in the area. Actively, uh, US, uh, Japanese government, also industry, took leadership to help the United States at the time. But in this time, uh, a different kind of like a, uh, a situation. But the Japan, do you think really uh, able to persuade and role more take leadership to really get uh, United States to really get involved in this uh, so-called green revolution? Uh, sir, uh, your uh, question was if Japan can really persuade United States to uh, uh, take uh, uh, to change uh, the position and try to be energy uh, more energy interested. Yes. Yes, I think. Uh, as I said, uh, this uh, goal of 25% uh, cut from a 20, uh, 1990 level is already a uh, very uh, ambitious goal that Japan has been taking. And uh, uh, I think, uh, for example, uh, we have some technology that uh, other countries s still don't have. Uh, for example, if you take nuclear power uh, plant, uh, United States has not been making nuclear power plants after three uh, miles. Uh, Japan, France has been doing this. Japan has been building almost 30 in the last 30 years. So, uh, of course, U.S. has the biggest number of nuclear power plants, more than 100, uh, where we only have a little bit more than 50. But still, I think the technology we can... Uh, uh, share and cooperate as well. Uh, high-speed railway, as I said, uh, U.S. is now starting to build high-speed railway. And here, the countries who have uh, experiences is, are France, uh, Germany, Spain, uh, Japan, and only few. So, uh, and Japan is the country who has started in 1964, the earliest, and uh, no mortal accident. And we also have... Uh, Maybe rather unfortunate, but a lot of experience on earthquake as well. So uh, earthquake uh, proof, uh, and these can be experiences could be shared as well. So I think, sir, uh, uh, Japan can take leadership and uh, will be exerting, trying to exert that. And I hope that uh, other countries, uh, including United States, would. Uh, uh, try to lead, take lead as well because this is such an important uh, field. Ambassador, thank you very much. Thank you very much.